so when you you have this whole cool cool worlds program over at Columbia yeah. that you've been doing, you also have an amazing YouTube channel where you oh, bring it you. to the public as well. But like, what's your process? Like, do you walk in there and say, "All right, let's find an exoplanet today," or is it more <laughs> way more targeted than that? And like trying to look at the exoplanets you already know that then allows you to find other exoplanets some way through that. How far away is this approximately? Yeah, about 30 light years, which is actually <laughs> yeah, pretty close. Work. That's actually really close by astronomy standards, yeah. So this is a very nearby favorite object. James Webb is uh, is spending a lot of time looking at this thing. And planet E, right in the middle there, that is, we think, the most Earth-like planet of the bunch in terms of it's, it's like the perfect distance, really. Yeah. And so there's a huge amount of attention to try and figure out, does that have an atmosphere? And does that atmosphere maybe have oxygen? Does it have, you know, the molecules that we have in our planet? But we can't tell that yet with the tools we have. Like it's too, no. it's still too far. So far, what we can tell is that planet B and C do not have atmospheres. That's something that James Webb has told us. So in the last year, we've discovered that. The inner two planets are so close to the star that the atmosphere must have been removed somehow. It's probably like been stripped off from the stellar, from the stellar activity. Wow, so almost like burned away. Yeah, okay. so the question is, uh, what's D like? And D, there's some ambiguity. Um, we need a bit more data. And E, we're collecting that data right now. So we, have we even been able to tell like, oh, there, there's water there? Or still no? No, we don't even know if there's an atmosphere there at this point. Yeah. Now, how do you collect that data then? Like you say, we're collecting that data now. Like, yeah, what so are they doing? It's mostly, it's a lot of transit work, actually. So that same technique of how we detect the planet um, imagine you do that same observation. You see the dip in light of starlight. Now, uh, you repeat that observation. Let's say we were imagining the Earth transit the sun, and we do it in the blue wavelengths mm -hmm. of light, um, and we do it in the red wavelengths of light. Now, what color is the sky? Well, to me, it's blue. Yeah, it's blue sky. And that's because our atmosphere <laughs> is Chris, I was Chris. I was waiting yeah. for a trick question yeah. there. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, to me, that shit's blue. <laughs> Fuck me, go A plus. We're, yeah. we're going. <laughs> we get a, we have a blue sky because um, the molecules in our atmosphere scatter blue light. Um, so if we didn't have an atmosphere, um, obviously that wouldn't happen. The sky would just look black. You wouldn't mm. have any of that. So if an alien was watching the Earth transit the sun and they did it in the blue wavelength, the you can kind of think of the atmosphere as being like opaque, like it would block out all the blue light. So all the blue light wouldn't be able to travel through the atmosphere. It gets stopped by our mm. atmosphere and that and bounces around. That's what makes it look blue. So therefore, the planet is effectively a bit bigger because it's the rock plus the atmosphere. So that's its size. Whereas in the red wavelengths of light, when you can see a sunset, the red light just goes straight through, no problem. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. So red just travels straight through the atmosphere and it will come out the other end, no problem. So the red light, uh, the, the atmosphere is not there, essentially. It's just the rock by itself. So you would see a bigger planet in blue wavelengths and a smaller planet in red wavelengths. And you can break that down into more fine colors. You know, you could look at individual wavelengths of light and carbon dioxide, for example, absorbs at exactly 4.6 microns, I think it is. And it makes the planet look huge. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at all these wavelengths, like 4.0, 4.1, 4.2. It's just the same size, same size, same size. And then you go to 4.6 and suddenly the planet looks bigger. Right. And you're like, oh shit, like it's got carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because that's the thing that absorbs that, that <laughs> wavelength. So that's how we can tell. Like we see the planets get bigger basically at the wavelengths of light where certain molecules absorb. Whoa. Yeah, it's pretty it all, clever. It all, and it all comes back we to can smell. somehow. We too. can smell the atmosphere. We can smell it? That's what we're doing, right? Wait, what? Wait, now I, you're losing me. Not, not literally, but, okay. but we, are, we are kind of figuring out the chemical composition. We are, it's like a snifferscope. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, you're seeing the light break down. You can figure out the, the, the chemicals. It is essentially, you know, it's using the sense of smell. <laughs> I, maybe it's not a good analogy, but I that's the way you. I think about it. Yeah, yeah you got to watch it because yeah. I'll start believing you when yeah. you start telling me, like, yeah, we can smell that shit. I think the Futura in Futurama, like, he actually builds a snifferscope in, yeah. in the show where he's doing things with his nostrils. <laughs> he's got a giant scope. <laughs> well, they say art imitates life. Yeah. Life imitates art, so you never know. Yeah. But what? So when you you have this whole Cool, cool Worlds program over at Columbia yeah. that you've been doing, you also have an amazing YouTube channel where you oh, bring it you. to the public as well. But like, what's your process? Like, 
do you walk in there and say, all right, let's find an exoplanet today? Or is it more, <laughs> way more targeted than that? And like trying to look at the exoplanets you already know that then allows you to find other exoplanets some way through that. Yeah, I mean, different groups have different goals and aspirations. And it really comes down to the individual leaders of these teams. Uh, for me, I'm not that interested in just discovering more planets. I'm kind of done with that a little bit. Like, okay, we've got oh, 6,000. We've got 6,000 <laughs> damn things. Like we don't need any more. Like we've, we've seen a bunch of planets at this point. So for me, I always want to do something new. Like it has to be something that's never been done before that's pushing the envelope. So for me, one of my big challenges has been to look for exomoons. So mm. moons around those planets. That's no, we have no confirmed exomoons whatsoever. Zero. Zero. Wow. Um, I found two candidates. Uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb uh, and the Kepler Space Telescope, so we have two candidate objects, um, and we are trying to get more data from James Webb to try and find even more and confirm the ones that we have. So, uh, what makes them candidates? Because uh, we just have one dip. So you know, I talked about earlier, like with these dips of light, you want to see like repeated dips, right? And then you're like, okay, that's real. But if it's a one-off, like you never know. Like it could just be something weird with it. Maybe there's someone uh, shook the telescope that day, or something went wrong, something electronic defect or something. So you just want to make sure that it's real. Um, and exomoons would be pretty cool to find. They could be habitable in their own right, like Pandora and avatars like that, right? You got all these blue aliens running around on the mm -hmm. moon. Um, so they could be like a huge fraction of alien. Maybe like most aliens live on moons and they look at the earth and like, oh, there's no point looking there because that's not a moon, right? They just think that planets Other are like boring around. places yeah. to look at. Um, our own moon actually is probably super influential for the earth being habitable. Some people say if you took away the moon, we wouldn't be here. Um, it stabilizes our axis. So if you took away the moon, the axial tilt is about 23 degrees, but it would wander, it would drift. And so you'd be some times where the North Pole was just pointing straight at the sun. And so the South Pole would just totally, you know, the Southern Hemisphere just totally freeze out yeah, for we also several have, months of the year. Wouldn't we also have like massive tide problems and stuff too? Without the moon? the moon? Well, you'd have less tides without the moon. You'd have you know, fewer tides without okay. the moon. So, but actually tides are thought to be a good thing for life as well. Um, one of the theories of the origins of life is like rock pools, basically. So if you go to a mm. beach and you see a rock pool, the chemicals get kind of concentrated in these little pools. And when the moon first formed, it was way closer. It would have been like about 30, 40 times larger in the sky. It was really close. And it would have ra raised, it would have made tides that were so big, the entire continent would have been covered. That's in what tide. I'm saying. And like yeah. Bruce Almighty, when he's like, yeah, it would have been like this, that. And then it's like flooding the whole right. fucking the earth. The whole planet would have been flooded, basically. And that would have happened every day. And oh, so uh, that, well, it's maybe maybe not good for building your house, but actually kind of good for getting things going for life because you can have loads of these rock pools covering an entire Let's continent. Let's not try that. I don't, I don't want to try that, but um, fortunately we don't have the ability to try that anyway. Okay. So that could be useful. And then, the, you know, the third reason is we want to one day actually take a photo of, an, of another Earth. I talked about this telescope before, the Habitable Worlds Observatory that we'd love to build if we could with NASA. We're doing some of the early calculations now about what that would look like. Um, maybe you can Google pale blue dot for me. Pale blue dot. Yeah, this is a famous photo of the Earth, actually. So you're talking directly with NASA about that? Uh, well, not me. I mean, I'm one of many astronomers, yeah. It's not like, hey, NASA, yeah, you don't have David Kipping like, here, start building it. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, yes, sir. We'll, we'll get at it right away. <laughs> I'll keep doing podcasts. We'll get yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if you look at, like, maybe the BBC image, it's kind of a cool one uh, so that is a photo of the Earth uh, taken by, I think it was the, one of the Voyager spacecrafts that took okay. this image. And Carl Sagan um, asked, the, asked the vehicle to turn around and take a photo of the Earth. So this is taken from, I think, where Neptune is, from the distance of oh, Neptune. Oh, wow. Yeah, far. so really far out. And obviously the Earth is just like basically a single pixel of just this, this smudgy blue thing. And that's kind of the image we're probably going to get one day of an exoplanet as we build these telescopes. So we'll hopefully get an image like that of another ex, you know, an Earth-like planet far from its star. But where's the moon in that image? You can't see it. It's just smushed it's in there. It's too small. Yeah, and so one of the reasons we want to look for these moons is because we need to know if that moon's in there or not because it makes a big difference to all this chemistry stuff I was talking about. So uh, one of the possible signatures of life is oxygen that we talked about. But oxygen can also be made without life. Um, water makes oxygen actually quite easily because it is you know made of oxygen yeah. so if you just split hydrogen up and oxygen you get you, you get oxygen in the atmosphere so that can happen it's called photolysis um so people say oxygen is not enough you need both oxygen plus something else and methane is usually the other molecule that people talk about um now titan is a moon of saturn that has tons of methane 
So if the Earth didn't have life, it, it might still form oxygen through this photolysis, a small amount. And if it had a Titan-like moon, it would have methane. And so you'd look at this blob and you'd see, oh, it's got oxygen, it's got methane, boom, we're done, it's got life. But actually it could be a lifeless world. Mm. So if you didn't know the moon was there, the moon could trick you into thinking you detected life when there isn't really life. So if we ever want to understand these images properly, we have to know if there's a moon there or not. So that's one of the other big reasons I think this is really cool to try and figure out the moon population in the universe. What's like the effect though when plants have multiple moons? Like we have one here, yeah. but like if you ran, I'm making something up, if you well, ran has tons, exoplanet. Yeah. But if you even ran into an exoplanet somewhere else, so not just within our, our solar system, like, you know, and you see one with four, mm -hmm. what effect is that having on life? Or is there even a way to, could it be multiple possibilities? Depends what the moons are doing, um, what their orbits look like. Yeah, so the, the moons of Jupiter, since there's there's four big moons of Jupiter, so, so they're the Galilean moons, um, and they do really wild stuff between them. So Io is like super volcanic. And the reason is, it's because it's, it's like a, a rock stuck between a hard place. It's got these three moons on the outside, which are kind of tugging it out. And it's got Jupiter on the inside, which is tugging it in. So it's just being like pulled mm. each way. And it kind of distorts and stretches the rock. And that actually causes all this volcanism on the surface of the moon. Um, it also, these moons don't stay in the same place. They move. So our own moon is moving away from us about one inch per year. Um, so, you know, in principle, you could lose moons eventually. Uh, if one billions inch of years. year. Yes, I said the moon used to be a lot closer, and that's the speed it's moving out. But I feel like we could make that up somehow with tech, like yank it back a little bit, moves 10 inches, you know. It's a lot of mass. It's big. It's a lot of mass. Yeah, we'll you need a lot of energy to do that. Um, it doesn't really affect us in any way. Actually, the cool thing is we do, well, it's not cool, but we'd eventually lose solar eclipses. As mm -hmm. you know, the moon is like the, basically the perfect size to block out the right. sun. As it gets further away, it will get smaller in a, in, a, in a projected sense. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.